Welcome everybody to uh, next talk. Uh, this talk is from uh, Mike and James who worked at IBM and they will give a talk about uh, address space isolation. Um, please, uh, when the talk finishes and the Q&A starts, please remain seated, it's not going to take long and we can hear the questions and then afterwards we can leave and don't disturb the Q&A. Um, for the next one, I'll give a warm welcome to these people. Please give a warm applause and the stage is yours. Thanks. Uh, I'm Mike. I work on uh, at, uh, memory management in Linux kernel. I happen to maintain a boot time memory management called the uh, Memblock. And uh, I'm an employee of IBM Research and uh, we are going to talk about our research, how to use memory management techniques to make containers even more secure than they are today. Okay. And I'm James. Um, my job in all of this was really just to persuade Mike that it was worth doing. Um, and since I gave a talk this morning, my voice isn't doing too well, so he's going to be doing all the talking, telling you what it's about. I'm going to be the demo monkey, because we have a demo right in the middle explaining how this all works in practice. And so with that, I'll hand over to Mike to do the slides. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it took a couple of years to get from CH root to cloud native. Uh, the containers, as you probably know, is, can, can be described kind of CH root on steroids. And uh, thanks to technologies like Docker and Kubernetes, containers now are everywhere. It's probably the most uh, popular uh, form of uh, application deployment. Uh, and uh, you may find uh, containers uh, deployments uh, in that or other form uh, both in private data centers and in public clouds. Uh, if you noticed, uh, if you used container uh, services in public clouds, they all uh, run uh, their Kubernetes clusters on top virtual machines, which creates kind of uh, unnecessary uh, level of uh, virtualization, which obviously costs uh, additional money, cycles, performance, and so on. One of the claims uh, to use virtual machines to run container installations because the containers are less secure than virtual machines. Uh, and proponents of uh, this claim usually say, guys, come on, uh, virtual machines have hardware that ensure their security. And like we all know, with Meltdown, L1TF, and everything, hardware probably not as good to ensure security for anything. Particularly with L1TF, VMs are much more vulnerable than uh, containers or simple processes. Nevertheless, uh, as the researchers, we were looking at interesting problems. And uh, we said, OK, we, all, we also can use some hardware to ensure isolation of containers. And what we have is MMU, so we will try to use MMU and to protect uh, Linux containers with uh, page tables. Uh, our goal is to make uh, containers less vulnerable uh, and uh, uh, besides, uh, we can presume that every system will be vulnerable in that way or another. So once an attacker has gained some control of the system, we are trying to make sure it will be harder for him or her to uh, penetrate to uh, containers of other tenants sharing the same system. For that, uh, we are proposing to use restricted address spaces uh, uh, to allow better isolation of uh, Con of privileged contacts of different tenants in the system. Uh, the containers surface, attack surface, is uh, the entire system call interface of Linux kernel, which is about 400 plus system calls. So the first questions we uh, question we asked ourselves was, what can we do to make system call less vulnerable, or at least uh, less exposing the rest of the system to the attacker. Uh, and uh, the other thing we've been thinking of is that uh, in Linux, containers are isolated may mo mo mostly using Linux namespaces. 
So what we are trying to do is to provide namespaces their mean of hardware isolation. In, in other words, we are trying to broaden namespaces with their own page tables. And we'll explain in a bit more detail what we are, try what we are trying to achieve. And there is a similar work that's done. Uh, some of it is already there. Uh, all of you probably know that uh, as a result of meltdown vulnerability, Linux kernel uh, started to use it restricted address namespaces for the first time, which is page table isolation. Uh, uh, there is a work ongoing at uh, KVM area to protect uh, virtual memories from uh, the host and from each other that also try to implement address space isolation in KVM and uh, another, uh, another mechanism that was dubbed as a process local memory uh, to ensure that VM secrets are visible only to that VM and are not visible in the host or in the other virtual machines. So um, what we tried first is to create a restricted address space for execution of a system call. Uh, it builds on the technology PTI introduced into the Linux kernel where the uh, kernel mappings uh, are very much restricted for the user space and part of the application. And uh, the only thing user space page tables contain are the code necessary to jump into the system call to the interrupt handler. We thought that probably it would make sense to extend this a bit and to make a system call execution inside the Linux kernel also use some very minimalistic page table and then uh, map uh, required pages on demand. So it would be something like, Jinx. oh, uh, so this is a page table uh, of the kernel part of a process. This is a page table of the user part of the process. Uh, the privileged code and data are not mapped in the user space page table except for the small part uh, required for uh, entry into the kernel. Uh, we introduced yet another page table that adds some uh, code that allows uh, code and data that allows selection of a particular system call uh, execution. And then when system call continues its execution, uh, we try to demand page uh, whatever code or data is necessary. Uh, the idea was that uh, whenever we enter system call, we switch in address space. And then uh, we remain in a restricted address space. And every access to an unmapped area causes page fault. And page fault handler can decide if the access is safe or not. If the access is not safe, we kill the offender. And if access is considered safe, we map the page and continue the execution. We actually implemented this thing. Uh, I think here, uh, the patches. Uh, we found out that this is really slow, like t times slower than normal system call execution. And uh, that uh, context switch are really costly. And also it has some uh, security weaknesses as well. Uh, we couldn't uh, validate red targets to actually prevent uh, ROP attack properly. Uh, we were competing with upcoming CT technologies that probably eventually will be available sometime. Do you know anything about CT? Intel has been promising it for several years. It's yes. supposed so to be in their next chip, but nobody's seen it. Uh, Intel CT is going to do the same thing, but in the hardware. So if the chips will be available, there is no sense in implementing uh, our approach. Uh, but we also thought about another possibility. We didn't try to implement anything that. Uh, one can use F-Trace to create a shadow stack of the execution. And then upon return uh, from uh, any routine, uh, there is a possibility to insert uh, uh, red hunks uh, using GCC or LLVM. That's what uh, Red Pauline does, for instance, with the call. 
it's possible to do the same thing with red, and then uh, at that thunks, uh, there is a way to check if the return address actually matches the shadow stack created with an F-trace. This should be faster than using a page fault for that. Uh, we don't know yet if it will fly at all. Uh, the next thing we were trying to do came actually from the idea some of the KVM uh, developers proposed a while ago on the mailing list. They call it process local memory. Uh, what we are suggesting, suggesting is to hide a piece of user process from the kernel. Uh, and obviously it won't be mapped in other processes. Uh, so this uh, memory can be used to store uh, secrets, for instance, keys and uh, maybe some other sensitive information. Another possible use case is to hide uh, virtual machine memory from the entire kernel and from the entire host. Uh, and uh, for instance, for storing a secret, this may be used in a way described here. We create a mapping with uh, particular flags. We open a secret file and uh, then read its contents into that mapping. Uh, the patches are here, if anybody is interested. It was a long discussion about this approach, about using a memory map with some flag. Uh, the outcome more or less summarized here. Uh, the pros were that uh, it was relatively simple. At least our submission was about 200 lines of difference. Uh, it can be easily plugged into existing uh, user space allocators, and it can be easily plugged into existing applications with uh, M Advise, M Protect, and such. Uh, but uh, the downside, uh, the implementation has to take into account uh, various uh, places of uh, the memory management code to address the kind of the mapping and to see if, for instance, it is possible to do M advice on such an area or if it's possible to pipe into the splice and so on, etc. And the most uh, significant uh, disadvantage of this was the necessity to fragment the direct map kernel used to map the physical memory. Because whenever we create a special mapping, in order to make it invisible for the kernel and for the privileged code, we drop this, me this memory from the direct map and uh, it requires a splitting of large and very large pages that usually constitute the direct map. Uh, I think, okay. Uh, so, uh, one of the feedbacks we've got on the MMAP map exclusive suggestion was that it's probably better to use file descriptor or device, uh, character device to create uh, such secret mappings. Uh, and we came with uh, another version of the patch uh, that actually extends MFD, MFD create system call. So to create a secret area, one has to create a file descriptor, this MFD create <coughs> secret. And then uh, you must call IOCTL to specify exactly the way kernel would uh, treat your memory. It could be exclusive, unmap, uncached, uh, maybe some uh, other different uh, properties there. Uh, and then uh, uh, continue with MMAP and use the memory in a secure way. It has an advantage of uh, less modifications to the core memory management. We don't mark uh, the allocated area uh, with anything except VM specials, so uh, we won't, wouldn't need to insert as many if something in the core MM. It is possible to pre-allocate memory at boot and then use it as a backend memory for such file descriptor based uh, memory management. We still would need to audit all the memory management code to make sure that uh, nothing uh, would try to access uh, the secret memory and uh, that uh, the safety is preserved. And uh, as it is file-based uh, memory management, we are 
it, it would use page cache mechanism in such way or another and the final implementation may introduce uh, some complexities into page cache management. And still we didn't address the huge gap of the fragmentation of the direct map which also may cause some pain in the future. Uh, I've recorded a slide just in case, but now okay. it's all yours. My job is to be the demo monkey. Can I actually get this demo up and running? Let's just stop the presentation. Let's get a same as so I can see what I'm doing. Bring up a GNOME terminal. Uh, how big does it need to be for you lot? So everybody can see that. Let me. Uh, yeah, of course, every tab you start also has to be sized. Great. So Mike actually sent the patch that does this to the mailing list, what, three days ago? So I have built a 5.5 kernel with this patch integrated, and that's actually what I'm going to demo to you. So uh, ignore the fact that this is UFI Secure Boot. This is where all, I've got all my demo kernels. So I'm just going to boot up this kernel in KVM. And then once it's booted up, I will log into it. And we're going to try twice to poke at the memory of what should be a container, but in order to convince you that this works generally, I'm just going to do a normal, ordinary process and prove that we can actually abstract its secrets. So if I just log into this um, system, I actually have a very simple program that uses OpenSSL. One of the great things about using OpenSSL is for reasons best known to the OpenSSL developers, they insisted on rewriting the body allocation interface for Linux, for glibc memory because they claimed it would make the program more secure. So OpenSSL malloc, if you use it in an OpenSSL program, and OpenSSL does use it for all of the private keys, um, should be actually give you more security according to OpenSSL. Realistically, as we'll demonstrate, it doesn't. But one of the great things is I can just use a preload library to override OpenSSL malloc and insert a special allocation thing into their body allocator, and then OpenSSL malloc is really allocating all of your private keys in secure memory. And so the purpose of this demonstration is a very, very simple program to actually do that. So this is it. It's basically I allocate a secure pointer using the OpenSSL malloc. I allocate an insecure pointer using the standard Linux malloc. I copy two strings into each of these pointers, and I print them out again. This is obviously highly insecure if you have access to the console, but it serves as a demonstration. The reason for printing it out again is to prove that the process itself can still get access to memory we've designated secure. And if I actually just, oh, and um, Usually, when you're dealing with secrets, the trick is to get the secret in, use it, and shred it as fast as possible. In order to demonstrate the actual program working, I put a pause in here that allows me to go in and actually try and extract the secret. So if I run this program, it's going to print out the two pointers. So, I mean, I haven't done an LD.SO override, so this is only OpenSSL's protection. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the biggest hammer I can possibly do, which is log into the virtual machine as root and see if I can extract the secret. So all I have to do is find the process. Uh, there it is. And then I can just ask GDB to attach to it. Oops. Which it does with no problem. It's stuck at the pause, so I just... Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. So I go up in the stack frame, and now I can actually print out the pointers. So here's the insecure pointer. This is, I'm running as root, so I can easily grub about in anybody's memory. And here's the secure pointer. 
So I can just, as root, extract all secrets from the system. So if I manage to compromise the system sufficiently, I could also do the secret extraction. So now what we're going to do is leave this. I'll come out here. Kill this. And now I'm just going to add a preload that overrides the OpenSSL malloc. Let me actually show you roughly what the preload looks like. It's basically the same program Mike showed you. So all it's doing is getting a secret memory thing. It's mapping a single page, and it's putting that page in a secure pool. And when you call OpenSSL malloc, it just returns the page. This obviously is not a body allocator, but for the purpose of demonstration where we only have a single allocation, it demonstrates all of the principles. And obviously, if I'm going to do this in practice, I would have actually written a body allocator. But I did this on the fly last night, and I couldn't be bothered. So. Let's apply the preload, and again, the program runs. Um, I actually, if you looked, put a debugging print in the OpenSSL malloc override, so we know that the secure pointer is now actually in Mike's secure memory. So what we're going to do is find it again, attach to it with GDB, okay, go up, and obviously, the insecure pointer was only in ordinary malloc memory, so I should still be able to get access to it. But now let's see what happens if I actually try to grub about in here and get access to the secure pointer. My program is killed, and if I actually have a look at what happened to the kernel, that is a paging fault in the direct map. So even root on this machine cannot get access to the secrets that a process deposited into its memory. And so this affords us a lot of useful secrecy for things like OpenSSL keys, HTTPS establishing secure channels in Can containers for a moment? in the cloud. Can you keep the terminal? Yeah, sure. So as we can easily see, right, the page is not present here. Uh, yeah. Back to the presentation. Back to the presentation. Okay. Let me just... Yeah, I know, you want it bigger. Thanks. Uh, now, another, another thing we are trying to do is to protect address spaces with namespaces, uh, namespaces with address spaces. And uh, uh, namespaces in Linux, uh, anyway, create their objects in a way that is, uh, is isolated from the rest of the system. So there is no actual need for a kernel code running in one namespace to access objects in the, oh, in, uh, objects in the other namespace. And, and that's why we think it would be possible to give each and every namespace its own page table and then just uh, uh, take care of some uh, rare cases of a uh, namespace transition for different objects. We've started with the network namespace. A network namespace creates a, a known copy of the entire network stack, TCP caches, UDP caches, uh, sockets, everything. They're all private to that network namespace. There is no need for any other namespace to touch the data in the caches of the network stack of other namespace. The only, uh, the only thing that behaves different, differently is uh, SK buffs which represent packets that usually traverse uh, several namespaces on their way to other services or out of the machine or into the machine. Uh, and then we started working on this. Uh, more or less at the same time, uh, KVM developers submitted their work for what they call KVM ASI. And uh, one of the comments for their, uh, for their submissions from Tomox Glexner, one of uh, x86 maintainers, was that uh, there are actually four points to creation of uh, restricted namespaces. Uh, there need to be a way to create restricted mapping. There need to be a way to switch into it and switch back to it. And uh, there should be uh, some uh, machinery to track the state to understand so the code could understand which, uh, and which address space it is actually using at the moment. 
and uh, together with the KVM guys, we started to work on uh, some uh, generic APIs that will allow usage of restricted address spaces in the kernel. Uh, first of all, the API for creation of the page tables. Uh, what we thought is that we need a first class abstraction for a kernel page table, which is non-existent as of today. The kernel presumes that everything, every address space has its MM struct that uh, actually used to represent users, uh, user process memory. It has a lot of information that is not necessary to represent the kernel page table. So what we're trying to do is to extract a page table information proper from MM struct and create a first class abstraction. We call it PG table for now. Uh, it may evolve with the, as time goes. Uh, then we need some API to populate this PG table and we need an API that will be able to tear down this PG table. Uh, the context creation varies in between different use cases. Uh, key VM guys uh, have it explicit on the VM enter, VM exit with the network namespace address with the address spaces of processes it uh, becomes implicit as a part of the context which is just uh, the page table of particular context is uh, reduced uh, because it is already there inside the namespace or because of some other reason uh, uh, and uh, freeing the restricted page table is kind of pain in the whatever uh, because uh, currently the code uh, in the kernels that actually frees page table very tightly bound to the MM struct and to the assumption that kernel page tables are never freed. And uh, there is a lot of care that must be taken in freeing page tables to um, probably play pro properly play with the TLBs and to uh, uh, avoid the TLB shootdowns as much as possible and uh, there is a lot of work we're going to do in that area. What did I do? Uh-huh. You should warn me. Uh, so on top of these page table management primitives that we are going to implement someday, we are trying to implement a private memory management allocation, private memory allocations that uh, page alloc or okay malloc will receive a particular flag that will say, okay, I want this page visible only in my page table and I want it absent in all the other page tables and I want it dropped out of the, from the direct map. Uh, so the idea was to add uh, some page flags for struct page and some flags for struct slab. Uh, as we got a pretty much of pushback on using new page flags on our first submission of MMAP exclusive, we'll need to think about some different way, probably using a page extension for this mechanism. And then we can use existing interface to tweak in the direct map, like set memory and P and set memory P, which makes my pages present or not present in the direct map. And again, despite uh, the availability of this interface, uh, it is really not good to use it because it will fragment the direct memory, memory and there is some ground work required to properly implement direct map manipulations and uh, maybe doing something like THP for direct memory as well. And for the private allocations using uh, KMALOC and uh, this family K KMM cache alloc, we are proposing a mechanism which is similar to what uh, memory C groups currently doing. Uh, we create another level in the hierarchy of the KMALOC caches and for every context there will be a new cache that uh, belong to particular like C groups create their own. We will also create our own for <laughs> address space one, address space two, etc. Uh, 
and if we are looking again at uh, address spaces for network namespace, we add the page table to the struct.net, which is the kernel representation of the network namespace. And uh, then uh, whenever a process joins the network namespaces using clone, uh, set NS or something like that, uh, its page table gets overwritten with the page tables that is common to all the processes uh, present in that network namespace and every allocation of the memory inside the kernel uh, makes sure that the uh, page is allocated privately to that namespace and that they are not visible in the direct map in other namespaces. Uh, we had some proof of concept mostly working uh, that socket objects and uh, escape buffers uh, were allocated using GFP exclusive uh, and using the exclusive memory. And I, I actually planned another demo, but uh, I couldn't get uh, Wi-Fi uh, on my laptop, so sorry about that. And uh, this is our current vision of how it's going to happen. Uh, it may evolve over the time, so we are going to implement some page table management API for management, for management of the kernel page table. Page allocator, slide allocator will use these APIs and then uh, it will be available to namespaces isolation as well as to KVM isolation for uh, what KVM people are doing. And uh, for the exclusive memory mappings, currently we are looking at extending a uh, page cache functionality and using that to implement uh, exclusive memory mappings. Okay, so to conclude, well, first of all, it would be nice to make all this work. It will take a couple of years or so, I presume. Uh, we can presume that using restricted uh, address spaces does reduce attack surface, but we yet to evaluate the per security benefits versus the added complexity and probably performance degradation. So to evaluate the pros and cons uh, we need to implement, so it will take some time. Uh, as we've seen with SCI, this is no go. Uh, the system causation we tried to do was too slow. We hope that uh, exclusive memory will be fast enough to be useful uh, in production, and we hope that address spaces for namespaces will also be fast enough. And uh, reworking kernel address space management in kernel is uh, really difficult because we have to break a lot of assumptions that go into kernel memory management. Uh, the major assumption was that there is single kernel page table and we don't need anything to actually manage, manage it. It's always there. So that's all I had to say. Uh, do you want to add something? Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, Thank you. Please raise your hand if you have a question. We, quit. we finished quite early, so we have plenty of time to move to the other room after the questions. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm afraid terminating processes this way will break the like, workflow of traces and debuggers. I mean, they usually ex expect some kind of error when they try to access a memory. That's the idea, right? Yeah, but in this demo, there was just a killed process. Right, but the theory of the demo is that somebody has already broken into your machine and tried something nefarious. You don't get killed in normal operation. And because it's a kernel page fault, we can actually choose the signal we give to terminate the process. And that signal can be picked up by the container orchestration software. And in addition, the kernel log is, contains a bit of a verbose uh, trace of what went on. That can also be passed up through Kafka in the container world and analyzed to show that you have a problem. I mean, I mean, if I actually saw a log message like this on one of my containers, what it shows me is somebody is trying to break into your system and they already have enough privilege to be trying to steal secrets. So this machine needs to be shut down as fast as possible. Thank you. All right, next question over there. Thank you, great talk. Okay. 
in the MemFD case, how does it play with SCM rights? And could you theoretically adapt this to be passed between processes? How it going to play with C groups? No, no, SCM rights, like passing the uh, MemFD to another process. Could you theoretically use something like SCM rights to then yes. securely donate that memory to another process? Yes. Oh, cool. It's a normal file descriptor, so you can do SCM rights, you can do LSM on it, and everything you can do on the file descriptor. So you could Pretty much like, like MemFD today, the usual MemFD, we just uh, thought that uh, instead of introducing a new system call, we extend the existing one. It makes sense. So you, can, you would then update the other processes, page yeah. tables in there. Oh, nice. Yes. Very cool. Okay, next question. Would it be po possible to use this work to further lock down uh, file system implementations in, in Linux kernel to isolate file system implementations? Well, in theory, it's possible. Um, so if you looked at the um, patches we are planning for network isolation, uh, we're planning to give the network namespace its own allocation of socket buffs. And if you terminate it at the end with a virtual function, that means we have an isolated network stack. It is not impossible in the kernel to isolate the file system in the same way using the mount namespace. <coughs> So we have a namespace to do this. Um, it's just that neither of us has looked at what the complexity of actually adding private allocations to the mount namespace is. So I can answer theoretically yes, but I have no idea because we've not tried it. Thank you. Okay, I see the next question over there. Thank you all for being so quiet. It's uh, really special. Have you explored looking at uh, using this with key rings? Uh, being able to allocate secure memory for key rings seems like an obvious choice. So there is a specific problem with the kernel keyring mechanism in that it has no C group or namespace isolation currently. So right at the moment, keyrings are shared amongst all processes. Where it is theoretically possible that we could use secret memory for, say, the user part of the keyring, but the protections it affords may not be as great as you think because. Um, you don't have, I mean, in, in the current model, it's actually only the chi children of the process can get access to the memory. And in fact, we uh, did the M MFD with close on exec, which means even the children don't get access. So this is really restricted. A key ring has a much more general use case within the kernel, and it's much longer lived. So I think we won't get key rings in secret memory until we get the key ring namespace, which is actually necessary in order to consume key rings in containers anyway. Without the key ring namespace, a key you put into a key ring, even in inside a container, is shared by all of the containers. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No? Oh, yeah, yes, got one there. here. Oh. One more question. Uh, this architecture, especially uh, adding a context to K-Malloc, looks much uh, uh, like a first step to microkernels. Yeah, Do you think we are heading into that direction? Okay, so this work does have contact points with microkernels. Um, but if you think about the architecture of a microkernel, and actually, um, although Mike and I are standing up here, we had a third guy called Joel Nider who also worked on us in IBM HIFA doing this. He was a microkernel guy, so his job was to bring microkernel techniques to what we were doing. But in a standard microkernel, it's actually all of the internal servers within the microkernel that run in their own address space. And the problem is that if a tenant can exploit one of those servers, you can limit the exploit to that server, but that tenant can still compromise any other tenant also using that server. So it doesn't provide a lot of protection in the microkernel against exploits that are exercised by tenants. Whereas if you look at what we're doing, we're actually trying to bring up an entire address space that belongs to the tenant alone. So any other tenant running in the kernel can't get access to this address space. So instead of trying to isolate the servers within the kernel, we're actually trying to isolate the access from the tenant from the top. That actually is a very, conceptually is very different from the way microkernels operate. So it's true to say that some, we, we definitely got our ideas by looking at microkernel work because Joel was very, very fanatical about it. But the ultimate implementation we have is very dissimilar from what a microkernel would do. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, still plenty of time. 
So with your demo, you stopped a bit trace by tracer from uh, accessing the tracing memory, but what it stops from like injecting code into the context of the process and well, execu basically executing it? Um, so the question is really about mechanisms we can use for protection. Thanks to the no execute bit um, in the modern processes, it's actually very difficult to inject code into processes and force them to execute it. It is definitely not impossible. And a root attacker has many other ways of compromising a process other than by trying to pull the secret straight out of the memory. So if they know we've deployed this protect, I mean, security is basically a um, turtles game. So, you know, we've gone down about a couple of layers in the turtle, but in order to get perfect security, you have to go down the infinite layers of the turtle. But what we're hoping is that this is definitely a building block for providing enhanced security, coupled with a few other security techniques that containers will use, like no execute memory, enhanced protections for the namespace, various other things. We might be able to block most of the standard attack channels. And obviously, when you do this, the black hats just tend to come up with new attack channels, which we look forward to seeing what they are. And we end up in an arms race to see if we can also block those with the same technology or whether we need new technology. So this is definitely not an end point for security in containers. This is just the beginning. OK, thank you. Um, we have another question there. Hey, um, have you discussed your design with uh, the potential consumers of uh, those um, patches? Say, um, the orchestra uh, container orchestration community or the uh, TLS providing libraries or something like that? And if so, uh, what was their reaction and will they adopt uh, the features that uh, you just presented? Okay, so um, as you probably know, there is a bit of a bifurcation between the container orchestration community, Docker, Go, and the actual mechanisms in Linux that implement containers. Most Docker people can get their heads around namespaces and C groups, but if you look at what Docker does, it still can't take advantage of a lot of the security mechanisms we have in Linux, the user namespace being the classic example. And so the kernel developer's view of the Docker community is that in the rare case they can actually formulate the question correctly, they usually don't understand the answer. So I would agree exactly that what we need to be doing is evangelizing our features, but just due to the fact that the complexity of what we've done in the kernel is almost incomprehensible to people who are managing orchestration systems, it's very difficult to have a sensible conversation about how you would make use of it. So I think the business end of the conversation goes to that demo that I showed you. This is a way of using a preload library in a container, which is very easy to do, to get security. Just put this ld.so in, attach it, and your container is more secure. And the Docker community will be perfectly happy about that. Trying to explain to them the mechanics of an address-based separation mechanism that pushes the page out of the direct map is probably going to cause their eyes to fall back in their head. Thank you. That, well, let's let's uh, leave it at these questions. It's been a good time already. Thank the speakers. Thank you for the clapping already.